In this lecture, we're going to talk about the important phase of data acquisition. If you recall the HR Analytics Project lifecycle, the data acquisition phase is the second phase after question formulation, and it comes before data management. So when we're talking about data acquisition, we're talking about a process of collecting, retrieving, gathering, and or sourcing data. Now this can also include the retrieval of archival data that might be sitting in records and paper form in your company, or in your HR information system, or enterprise resource planning platform. Now there's different types of tools we can use to acquire data, and these include employee surveys, rating forms, surveillance and monitoring tools, database queries, and even scraping. Now this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is a good representation of the tools that we use most commonly in HR analytics. So let's start with employee surveys. These are nearly ubiquitous. You'd be hard pressed to find a company in their HR department or any department in the company for that matter that doesn't use some type of survey, whether they're surveying customers, clients, employees, managers, what have you. Now these are excellent tools for acquiring self or observer report data, such as data on personality, attitudes, individual differences, behaviors, as well as anything that's perceptual in nature, where you want an employee or a person's perspective on it, such as perspective and perceptions of the work environment, the work itself, the job itself, the work family interface, how they're managing conflict between work and family domains, their supervisors, their coworkers, and even the clients as well. So surveys can be really, really powerful tools in this way, and they tend to be pretty cheap to administer once you develop them. Now, here's an interesting fun fact about using surveys and measurement tools. There's a big meta-analysis that was done by Owen colleagues in 2011, and what they found is that actually, if you're looking at the big five dimensions, which we commonly use different measurement tools in the form of a survey to collect data on this, most often we ask people to self-report their conscientiousness, their extroversion, their emotional stability, their agreeableness, and their openness. Now, what is interesting is this meta-analysis in which they looked over a number of different studies, they found that actually observer-reported big five dimensions tend to be better predictors of job performance than self-reported big five dimensions. And so what that means is that sometimes, perhaps others have a better understanding or can recognize our personality with greater accuracy than maybe we can recognize it in ourselves. So it's something to consider is also the source and who's completing the survey and who are they referencing or what's the target of their responses when they're going through the different survey items or questions. Now in terms of disadvantages of employee surveys, they can be time consuming to develop them well. And so there's a lot of bad surveys out there. I'm sure you've come across them in all shapes and forms, particularly customer surveys can be pretty poorly constructed in some cases. And so we need to think really carefully about how we design these and design them with a specific purpose. And we wanna make sure that we're not overly fatiguing the people who are participating in the survey. Sure, it would be great to ask them every kind of question you could imagine where it takes five hours to respond, but are people actually going to do that? or are they gonna provide good data all the way through that administration? So as a rule, we wanna keep surveys as quick and short as possible, and we don't want to give too many surveys to employees as well, because this can also lead to fatigue over time. Now, the other thing about surveys is they are inherently subjective in nature. They tend to be more subjective than some of the other tools that we'll talk about. Now, the reason that this can be problematic is that, well, they might be more subject to things like social desirability biases and even faking. People might feel like they know what the employer is trying to get out of them or what they'd like to hear, and therefore they might skew their responses in that direction. Alternatively, they also might not feel comfortable responding to certain things. So imagine the situation in which you're asking people about coworker to coworker conflict and you're asking them to report on that. Well, perhaps they don't feel comfortable doing that because if they feel like they could be identified, even if you tell them that their data are gonna be completely anonymous or confidential, they still might be fearful that the data would get out and it could destroy some of their relationships in the company. So let's move on to another type of data acquisition tool that's also quite prevalent and common, and it's actually very much related to employee surveys. And that are, these are the rating forms that we use throughout organizations. Now again, they're pretty similar to employee surveys, but they tend to be more focused on measuring performance in the organization. Now, it's also another advantage of using these rating forms is they tend to be better than using no rating form at all. So if you don't ask managers to rate things systematically, they're gonna be likely to introduce more bias and subjectivity into their evaluations of their employees or of themselves and so forth. 
So you can think of rating forums as having a lot of the same advantages as employee surveys, and they also tend to be much better than not having a rating form, which isn't a super high bar, but yet it's important to remember. Now in terms of disadvantages for rating forms, it's important to make sure that you achieve high reliability between raters who are using the same form, whether these are supervisor rating their, their employees or whatever the case might be. Now this is easier said than done. Sometimes this requires a frame of reference training, calibration meetings, and things like this that take time to get everybody on the same page so they're conceptualizing job performance for that particular job in the same way or conceptualizing whatever the behavior is in a consistent way between one another. Because importantly, reliability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for validity, meaning we need to have consistent measurement and consistently measured tools before we can have accuracy. So things need to measure, be measured consistently before they can be measured accurately. Now, alternatively, we could be measuring something consistently, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're measuring it accurately. So in a, another disadvantage of using a rating form is they can also be quite expensive to build and do correctly. You should have a rigorous job analysis on file that's recent and up to date, it, especially if it's in the context of performance evaluation tools, to make sure that performance evaluation tool is reflecting the current job and the nuance of that job and so that it is applicable to today's standards for that job. Now, in particular, there's a type of rating form called the Behavioral Anchored Rating Scale or the BAR Scale. And these can be really time consuming and resource intensive to develop properly because they involve critical incidents and things like that you need to collect from a variety of subject matter experts. And if you do do your due diligence and develop these well, you can have a really great tool that can be really, really effective. And that point forward, it can be relatively quick and easy to administer. But the developmental side of these can be really, really, really time consuming and might require outside consultants or experts to come in. Now, another thing about rating forms too, or anytime you're rating people or you're using ratings for administrative purposes, is that they're likely to be subjected to different biases, such as office politics. Now, there's a really famous study from 1987 by Longenecker and colleagues, in which Longenecker and colleagues surveyed and interviewed a number of managers and executives, and to really understand how pervasive are office politics and organizational politics when it comes to making performance evaluations. And it turns out, uh, in these candid interviews, a lot of the executives and managers said, well, actually, a lot of times I don't really give the person the rating I think they deserve. Instead, I give them a rating to send a message, or I recognize that, wow, if I give this person a high rating, that might cause conflict because this other person might be offended. They didn't get a high rating. And so it talks about all these different biases that get injected due to office or organizational politics. So let's move on to another type of common data acquisition tool that's becoming increasingly common today because of rapid advances in technology. And these are those surveillance and monitoring acquisition tools that we can use. Now in terms of advantages, these tend to be highly non-intrusive and they tend to operate, quote, behind the scenes. And what this means is that people can wear these things. Sometimes they're even called wearables, either in a helmet, personal protective equipment, maybe it's a wristband that's measuring their heart rate. It's measuring the speed with which their, their, um, their walking, their geolocation, also the tone of their voice, if it's a sociometric badge or something like that. It can also, if it has an actigraphy monitor in it, it can measure sleep quantity and sleep quality. It can measure things, especially if it's a hard hack, like the force of impact. So if something falls on someone, it can send out a signal. It can also detect noxious chemicals and things like that. There's a number of different surveillance and monitoring tools out there and various sensors that we can use. Now, so these are very, very handy for capturing data, particularly around employee safety and employee health, as well as they can help you understand who's talking to two in the company by collecting tone of voice and help develop a more informal understanding or an understanding of the informal social network within a company. Now, in terms of the disadvantages, as you can imagine, employees might perceive these, while not intrusive in nature in terms of the data being collected, they might perceive the data themselves as being collected as very intrusive and perhaps a violation of ethics and as well as their privacy. And even data security concerns might creep in there as well as they're concerned that the data might, particularly around heart rate, sleep quality, and things like that might actually get out of the company and those could be potentially damaging for a person or their reputation. Now, there's also other disadvantages to using surveillance and monitoring tools, and these include wrangling and managing the data. The data from these tools, they're often constantly streaming, maybe coming at a fast velocity, 
And so it requires some more adept, highly, more advanced types of data management techniques that perhaps you don't have already in-house in your company. And so this can be challenging to deal with. Also, some of the data is gonna be less than structured, maybe semi-structured, even unstructured, where you might have to spend a lot of time to add structure to those data in order to even analyze it or make sense of the data. Now, another thing, and this really seeps into that concern about ethics, would be these data, especially if you're collecting information about someone's heart rate, their sleep quality or quantity, through these different wearable sensors people might um, walk around with at work, well, these data might actually correlate with different health outcomes and symptoms. So the question really becomes, should you use the data in this way, particularly if they're correlated with certain things that might be kind of HIPAA protected if you think about it in that sense, that these are things that this is health information that could be getting out there about someone. Alternatively, what you do with the data matters too. If you're using these data, for instance, around heart rate and sleep quality to predict performance at an individual level, employees might perceive that as being very invasive and there's some ethical questions around that. Okay, so let's talk about another really common data acquisition tool and this involves using a database query. And so this is really about grabbing the archival data or the data that already reside in your HR information system or your enterprise resource planning platform. And so database queries, one of the advantages is that they're really, really efficient because you already have the data there. It's also a way to leverage the data you already have and to make sense of it as well as to use it for answering questions that you might have posed during the question formulation phase of the HR Analytics Project lifecycle. The disadvantages of database queries and using archival data in your HRIS and your ERP are that there's really no guarantee that the data are going to be of high quality or that they're even going to be trustworthy. Also, unless carefully documented, important characteristics and definitions regarding the data residing in the database may be challenging to locate if, they're even, if you're even able to locate them at all, if they were ever even created in the first place. And this gets even more challenging when you're merging or joining data from across different platforms, maybe across different geographic locations, across different countries with different standards, and bringing them together. So this is another potential disadvantage of using that particular data acquisition tool. Now, let's finish up by talking about a relatively new term, at least in terms of how we're automating this technique using information technology, and that is scraping. So scraping is a technique used to extract data from websites and other text documents, whether they're emails or other documents you have residing within the organization or outside the organization. So the advantages of using scraping is that there's re these really neat new tools offered through packages in R or Python that make it easier than ever to scrape data, so to extract these data from these documents. And this can really lead to new insights into previously kind of difficult to reach data. Or you can answer questions in new ways and more robust ways that you had previously posed. Now, some of the disadvantages are, again, ethical and privacy concerns. Now, do people know you're scraping their data? Particularly if they're, you're doing it from emails, if you're doing it from social messaging boards within the organization, you're doing it from social media platforms. Do the employees understand, is this gonna be a violation of their trust? How are you going to use the data? How are you gonna protect those data as well? Are they identified? Are they confidential? Are they anonymous? Further, when you scrape the data, while the process of extracting the data might be relatively straightforward and efficient, it can be really time consuming sometimes to work with these data as often they come in in a relatively unstructured or semi-structured form. And this, there's gonna be more data management time that needs to be applied to these data in many cases. In addition, a lot of times these data might be qualitative in nature, meaning that they tend to be text. They might be, which means you have another layer of, well, how are you going to analyze these? They don't have inherent quantitative properties. Are you gonna use thematic analysis, content analysis, are you going to use text analysis, latent semantic analysis? What are you gonna do with these data? Now, as a guiding principle when it comes to data acquisition, think about this. Make sure you acquire data with a purpose in mind. And this is why it's important to start with that question formulation in your HR analytics project lifecycle. You wanna make sure you have that question, that research question, that hypothesis in place first before you go on and acquire data because if you don't have that question in place, you might just be collecting data for whatever reason. And this could be inefficient. It could also start getting into some risky areas where you're getting data that maybe you shouldn't be getting data or maybe you should think carefully about whether you should grab those data.
So make sure you acquire data with a purpose. And again, this is an important phase of the HR analytics project lifecycle. It comes after question formulation and it comes before data management and it is the data acquisition phase. So this wraps up the lecture on data acquisition.